I want you to think for a moment about this phrase that says, necessity is the mother of invention. Growing up at a home, in our home, we, our entertainment was actually sitting around and watching the black and white TV. I can remember watching Batman and Robin. Not the new Batman and Robin, <laughs> the old Batman and Robin. I can remember watching Bugs Bunny and watching Hanna-Barbera cartoons. And one day, I was, as we were sitting watching the television, a catastrophe happened. The rabbit ears broke. <laughs> and my father, he being a Mr. Fix-It man, he just gets up and goes to the closet, just nonchalantly, and he pulls out a coat hanger. And he takes the coat hanger and he unwraps it and he says, I got some rabbit ears. And he puts the rabbit ears on the, the coat hanger on the TV and then he says, I can do better than this to get a better reception. He takes some aluminum foil and wraps it around the coat hangers and that was our antenna so we had TV. It is so true that when things happen and we're pressed against the wall, we become very innovative. When it comes to this innovation, we find ways to do things that we never thought we could do. When it comes to the Lord, he has shown us a pathway when it comes to creativity. And he says, you know, while he looks at this world and sees it in such chaos and such darkness, he doesn't shake his hands, he doesn't walk off and kind of worry about it. He actually creates, he gets to work. And so he shapes our formless world and he begins to start looking at a variety of things that he could do with just the materials that he has to work with. So he creates this variety, species of animals and different birds and different plants. Then he puts a system in place, he puts a system of seed so that it can reproduce life. And when it comes to this work that he does, at each stage of his work, he gives the Holy Spirit and Jesus a high five and says, ooh, that's good. <laughs> God has given us creativity as well and that he's given us gifts. And maybe you were in school when you were actually painting or doing some kind of arts and crafts where the teacher said, you know, just make sure you're coloring the lines. But when it comes to creativity, it's not always coloring in the lines. Sometimes it's really about coloring and looking outside the lines and allowing our minds to expand and allowing ourselves to go outside and create. Because when we do that, something possible and awesome things can happen. But there are challenges. And the reason why we need to be creative because there are challenges. And the reason why we need to be innovative because there are challenges. One of the challenges are economic growth. Another challenge that we have is workplace stability. We also have the challenge of population growth. When it comes to economic growth, the Huffington Post wrote an article on June 26th of this year, and it was entitled, Five Years After the Great Recession, Our Economy is Still From Being Recovered, or Being Recovered. And it's, it's interesting to know that while the recession has happened some five years, so almost six years now, we have not recovered. We have added 198,000 jobs per year, but even if we stay at a stable rate, it's going to take us five years to actually get the jobs back that we lost. When it comes to workforce stability, that's about more and more uh, baby boomers. And the baby boomers now, the, uh, is going to be turning, the last one's going to be turning 50 years old this year. And there's a reconsideration about, well, how do we recover? How do, can I actually retire? Will I have enough money? And so they're staying in the workforce at much longer rates. And when it comes to workforce uh, stability, we need to recognize that that does create a bottleneck for new employees and new workers and new people that want to get jobs, college students that come out 
who spend thousands of dollars that they probably will have to repay back, how will they get jobs? And so the economy is really a problem. And when it comes to the population, the population is also growing as well. And so the Washington Beacon records that as populations keep growing, will we be able to keep job growth at the rate of population growth? But this situations that we face, it's not without hope. Because we have challenges, we certainly cannot be afraid to look outside the box. And one of the things about looking outside the box is to first get our thinking outside the box. Our thinking about how we actually go about creating jobs. And so I propose that we think about entrepreneurship. What an entrepreneur is, is someone who exercises initiative by organizing a venture uh, to take advantage of an opportunity as a decision maker and decides what and the how and the how much good or service will be produced. And so entrepreneurship thinking is really an out of the box thinking. And when it comes to the church, we should be thinking about entrepreneurship because there is a piece to the puzzle. While we can't do the work of government and we should not do the work of government, government has their own work to do, but the church can come alongside and add their piece to create a bridge with these gaps and to bridge these gaps that we have as it relates to job creation. <coughs> One of those gaps that we can bridge is helping to develop young entrepreneurs. The Abundant Life Church where I, where I pastor, we were hit with a little bit of dilemma. When we were talking to our young people, we recognized that they had some educational needs. Some of them didn't write on grade level. Some of them did not read on grade level. Some of them had problems with mathematics and had difficulty in school. Then of course, the kind of logical thing to do was like, well, we'll just get them math tutors. We'll just get them English tutors. We'll just get them individuals that can just help them with those courses. And something happened where we were able to connect with uh, Babson College and work a program that they had um, in, their, in their organization called NIFTY. NIFTY was called the Young uh, National Foundation for Teaching Entrepreneurship. And it was through that program we started to think a little bit out of the box and asked ourselves the question, why not bring entrepreneurship in the church? Why not create this space where young people can learn how to write and how to read and how to public speak and how to sell and how to buy? And so we started to gather young people and we started to work in the areas of entrepreneurship and organize a program. We called it BizCamp. So for one week, we brought the middle schoolers and the high schoolers in, and we began to talk to them about this entrepreneurship venture that we were doing. And at the end of the process, they had to write a business plan. They had to actually share what they were going to do and actually how they were going to do their businesses. Out of these businesses or these business experience, they actually had candy businesses where um, some of the kids would actually sell candy. And you might say, well, that's not a big deal. Well, it kind of is because uh, this little boy named Mark, and he happens to be my son. When my son, he saw that his friends uh, wanted to buy candy and the candy machines did not have the kind of candy that they wanted. So what he said, I'll go and buy the candy that you want. He would make out a menu, make out a list. And we would go to BJ's and he would fill up his lunchbox and buy candy <laughs> per their taste. And uh, it was an awesome thing because he said, Dad, look how much money I got from the candy work that we're doing. I said, that is great. And so we worked together to have Mark's Candy Canteen. <laughs> and it ended up where the school had to shut them down because they said, you know, we got to shut this business down because you're taking away some of our profits. <laughs> some of them started babysitting services and were certified by the Red Cross. So, there were some businesses that came about through entrepreneurship. It also led to learning how to barter with their peers and talk to their peers about their businesses. And of course, you see this young man here, he likes the end result, <laughs> money. <laughs> when we're thinking about youth and entrepreneurship, we're also talking about having uh, field trips. And they took many field trips to different businesses within the community. And so they went to, uh, two actual restaurants, and they talked to restaurant owners, 
And you also see that they talk to a owner of a funeral home. One of the little boys asked the question, well, how do you market a funeral home? He said, don't worry, people are dying to get in. <laughs> and it was an awesome time for other businesses to get involved when it comes to entrepreneurship. And they are willing, so willing to work with churches and work with people of faith to see that young people have an opportunity. We're not only working with young people, but with adults. I'm so privileged to be a co-teacher with Dr. David Gill at the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary to Boston campus. And we had a, an innovative idea and say, well, why can't we start helping adults have businesses? And so we pulled together a number of people from uh, pastors and business individuals who, had, who already had businesses. They would be mentors. Students that wanted to learn and students that really had a desire to do business but never thought they really could do it. And out of this group that we have here, we had a number of people actually start businesses. One particularly was a, a young woman named Jennifer Dungy. And uh, she was um, preparing herself to do a business, but she really didn't know how. And to add pressure to it, she's a, uh, she actually taught song, singing lessons at a music school. And the music school had to close down because it had financial constraints. And so she started a business, Lift Up Your Voice. Business is incredible. She hired teachers, and she started giving opera lessons. And guess where her first recital was? It was at the Abundant Life Church. And it was an awesome thing that happened where we could see that entrepreneur gain some ground. Another story is this gentleman here, Victor Kuby. Victor it, came into the program, and he had a really difficult time with culture, difficult time um, understanding and reading, being Latin American. And so when Victor came in, he was almost quitting the program, and we encouraged him to stay in. And we said, Victor, don't quit. Victor, don't quit. And Victor really got up enough courage to try it. He had the best presentation out of, all, out of many of the uh, awesome presentations that we had. And today, Victor is running a business called Victor for Hire. And so I saw Victor because I hired him too. So I'm one of his clients. And Victor is actually cleaning the lawns and cleaning outside the building. And I said, Victor, how's it going? He said, oh, pasta, it's going so good. <laughs> and uh, as we're talking to Victor, I saw a man in the background, and he's cleaning up the leaves. And I said, Victor, who's that? He says, oh. I have an employee now. I'm a boss. <laughs> and it's amazing. We have some amazing stories of people who came in who never thought they could do business doing business. Here's some ideas and possibilities that run through my mind that I just want to kind of point out to you. And maybe there's a piece that you might be able to get involved with. And that is mentoring. Entrepreneurs need mentoring. They need people beside them who know how to do business, know how to lead. We need benchmarking where we can see what practices are working, what things work, and what things don't. Because entrepreneurship is really about sometimes trial and error. We need investors, people to step forward with the ability to invest their time, their talent, and their treasure. Micro-lending. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not a philanthropist, and I'm not, I don't have a lot of money, but maybe you can do something in micro-lending where it's just a small business loan, a small seed that can help an entrepreneur. Seminaries can get involved that we can add to the robust teaching and training about how God is a God of work. And also we can have resume building and we help people beef up their resumes so that they can be marketable <coughs> to corporations or marketable to other entities for jobs. Training programs. Why not offer training programs to help increase people's skills? And so as we do that through the local church and do that in our various um, agencies or wherever we work, we can offer these training programs. And then, of course, local church support. We can support entrepreneurs through prayer. We can support entrepreneurs as pastors by visiting their workplaces, by encouraging them to take steps of faith, to believe that they can do something that they never did before, to think out of the box. And so with that, I want to encourage you to be part of this great process and build and help create businesses and be a bridge 
so that others can experience the greatness of God's favor in their life. Thank you. Larry, thank you very much. And uh, we can certainly see how your faith has been practically applied. And I just had a question of, as you've demonstrated your faith practically applied, how has it changed the view of these folks who are benefiting from that practicality in their view of faith and God? Oh, that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> well, they, when it comes to business, business persons or individuals, first of all, they recognize that the church cares about their work. And secondly, I think for their viewpoint, they really see that faith is a real part of the process mm -hmm. of everyday life, their wealth, their health, and their well-being. And so as they start creating businesses and they start getting involved in these types of activities of creating jobs and being an entrepreneur, it's really radically changing them because you know why? Because when you're starting a business, you really have to have faith and you really have to believe God. Absolutely. <laughs>